Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about the lung pleura. This is a clinical anatomy video. Let's begin by reviewing the respiratory tract briefly, starting from the larynx here, goes down to the trachea, trachea bifurcates into the primary bronchi, which then enters the right lung and the left lung. Behind the respiratory tract, is the esophagus, which then leads to the stomach below the diaphragm. Each lung is enveloped or enclosed by a sac, which consists of a continuous serous membrane. This is the pleura, and the pleura will form the pleural cavity. So here you have the right lung pleura, and you have the left lung pleura. You can think of the lung pleura like the pericardium of the heart. Like the pericardium, it's a sac where the lungs sit. Here is the diaphragm, which is an important muscle for respiration together with the intercostal muscles and the serratus. The heart sits here in the mediastinum. The liver is in the right upper quadrant below the diaphragm. Let us now look at the pleura and see its relationship to the bones. Medial and anterior, you will find here the manubrium, the sternum, and the xiphoid process. The clavicle is on top and attaches to the manubrium. Here is the axilla, your armpit area. And here you have the ribs which protect your lungs and heart as shown. You have 12 ribs numbered here in red. Some important anatomical landmarks. If we draw a straight line in the middle of the clavicle, we can call this the mid-clavicular line. And here is your mid-axillary line where the axilla is. You draw a straight line down where your armpit is essentially on the side of your body. These are landmarks which are good to know because you can tell where roughly the lung margins and the pleural margins are. Remember that each lung is enclosed in a pleural sac. The pleural margins we're talking about here is the outermost pleura membrane called the parietal pleura. And we'll talk about this more a bit later. Anyway, as you can see, at the mid-clavicular point, the lungs should end at about the sixth rib. In this diagram, it shows the seventh rib. But let's just say it's the sixth rib. The pleural margin is always two above this, so it ends as shown at the eighth rib. Looking at the mid auxiliary point, you can see the lung margins ends at the eighth rib, and the pleural margin, which is two above this, ends at the tenth rib. Let's now focus more on the lung pleura and why it is a sac which holds the lungs and why there are two pleural membranes, even though it's actually one continuous membrane. Here is the part of the respiratory tract and the lungs. Here are the ribs. Here is ribs eight and ribs 10. Remember, the lung margins at the mid axillary is about the eighth rib. Before introducing the pleural membrane and the pleural cavity, remember the root of the hilum here, because it is here where the continuous sheet of the lung pleura changes from what's called the parietal pleura to what's called the visceral pleura. The parietal pleura in blue extends to the root of the lung, the hilum you can say, but remember the pleural membrane is a continuous sheet and it continues and then it continues and envelopes the lung. This in orange now is known as the visceral pleura, which essentially adheres to the lungs. So again, at the root of the hilum, you have the parietal pleura, which goes and attaches to the thoracic wall. And at the root of the hilum is when it changes into the visceral pleura, which envelopes the lungs. So you can say that the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura meet at the root of the hilum. And thus the pleura itself is a continuous serous membrane, serous sheet.
and this continuous membrane or sheet is more like a sac where the lungs actually sit. Now, because it is a sac, in between the parietal and visceral pleura, you have the pleural cavity or the pleural space. In the pleural cavity, you have pleural fluid. The pleural fluid flows through the pleural cavity. The pleural reflection is essentially a line where the pleura itself, the pleural membrane, changes direction. To complete this diagram, really important, the parietal pleura in blue covers the superior surface of the diaphragm and moves with the diaphragm during respiration. Here is the mediastinum where the heart sits. Now let's cut a cross section of this area of the thorax to better understand the pleural membranes and the pleural reflections. Here is the posterior part of the thorax. You can see the spine, the, the, the vertebrae. Here are your primary bronchi, which enters your lungs on the left and on the right. Remember you have in blue your parietal pleura, which attaches to the thoracic wall. Surrounding the lung is the visceral pleura, which is the continuation of the parietal pleura. The changes in name and direction described is known as the pleural reflection. In between the parietal and visceral pleura is the pleural cavity, which contains the pleural fluid. In front of the vertebrae and behind the trachea is where the esophagus goes down. Next to the esophagus, more so on the left side, is the descending aorta. The mediastinum can be divided into several compartments, as you know, one of which is the posterior compartment, where we can find the esophagus, the descending aorta, and then you have the middle compartment of the um, mediastinum, where we can find the heart, and then you have the anterior compartment, which is the sternum. Now let us draw a posterior view of the body, and let us now uh, look at more body landmarks. Um, so we can uh, again outline the lung margins and the lung pleura from the back. Looking at the back of the person here, you can find the scapula, the vertebral spine. In front of the scapula and uh, vertebrae, you have the right and left lung, and you also have the pleural membrane. Coming off the th thoracic vertebrae, you have the ribs, your ribs. Here is ribs 10 to 12. Again, if we draw a line down the middle of the scapula, you can call this now the mid-scapula line. The lung margins, as you can see, finishes at about the 10th rib in the mid-scapula line. And the pleura finishes at about two above this, which is ribs number 12. Again, the mid-axillary line is the imaginary line running through where your axilla is, your armpit, basically on your side. Let's take a closer look at this area here down the bottom and look at it uh, in a bit more detail and the structures. So here's your visceral pleura, which covers the lungs. Here is the parietal pleura, which is a continuation of the visceral pleura and uh, attaches to the thoracic wall. And here, and here is the space in between, which is called the pleural space or the pleural cavity. Now the parietal pleura in blue, as I mentioned, attaches to the thoracic wall. And here, the thoracic wall are your ribs. In between the ribs are your intercostal muscles, which hold the ribs in place and also assists in respiration. From the most in, inner, inner layer of the intercostal muscles is the innermost intercostals. Then after that is the internal intercostals and then your external intercostals. This area I'm drawing here can also be called the left costodiaphragmatic recess. On a chest x-ray, this area is called the left costophrenic angle. Now the left costophrenic angle is very useful to look at on, the, on a chest x-ray because clinically, if there is blunting or if the edge is filled, sort of, this can signify pleural effusion. The diaphragm attaches superiorly to the parietal pleural layer. Pleural fluid fills the pleural space. And pleural fluid comes from the parietal pleural circulation, which is the main source. It also comes from the visceral pleural circulation from the lungs.
and also partly by, from the peritoneal cavity via small holes in the diaphragm. Now, the pleura membrane, in summary, has many functions, but two main ones. Firstly, you can imagine, because it attaches to the lungs and the thoracic wall, it actually allows for changes in lung shape during respiration. And secondly, the pleura prevents the lungs from collapsing, maintaining positive transpulmonary pressure. Let's zoom into this area here where the parietal and visceral pleura are in close proximity and learn a bit more about the physiology of the, you know, the pleura itself. So again, here in orange is the visceral pleura and in blue is the parietal pleura. In between the visceral and parietal pleura is the pleural cavity. The visceral and parietal pleura is made up of mesothelial cells. Below the visceral and parietal pleura is the basement membrane. The space below the visceral pleura is a visceral space, which is also basically the lungs, which contain the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries, ready for gas exchange. The parietal space is also the thoracic wall. You have systemic capillaries in this area. You also have lymph vessels here called the parietal lymph vessels which drain the fluid from the pleural space. Interestingly, as discussed, the source of the pleural fluid is mainly from the parietal pleura, from its systemic circulation. There is also some fluid produced from the visceral pleura as well. Ultimately, the fluid circulating through the pleural cavity will drain into the parietal lymphatics mainly. And the parietal lymphatics is able to absorb 20 times more fluid than is normally formed, which is kind of important, especially if there's too much parietal fluid being produced. The substance that are found in the parietal fluid are also things that are produced by the mesothelial cells, which include things such as glycoproteins, uh, TGF-beta, and nitric oxide. Now let's look at some clinical anatomy of the lung pleura, beginning with pleuritis, which is inflammation of the parietal pleura, mainly due to viral infections. Clinical signs include shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain, which is characterized by essentially pain when breathing in. And also pleuritis has a characteristic pleuritic rub, which can be heard during expiration and inspiration sounds like creaking or grating sounds, something like this. Again, the main cause are viruses, but autoimmune conditions can also cause pleuritis. The next clinical anatomy condition for the lung pleura is pleural effusion, which is accumulation of fluid in the pleural space, usually as a result of inflammation of the pleura. Standing up means gravity will push the fluid down. The area where the fluid is means that there is decrease in breath sounds if you try to listen to it there. And also there will be dullness on percussion because it's just solid, all fluids. There will be also decrease in lung expansion. Here's an example of a chest x-ray with someone who has left-sided pleural effusion. Here is the meniscal sign. And as you can see, all this colored here is fluid within the pleural cavity. Usually small pleural effusions resolves alone. But if there's so much, and if you want to diagnose the cause of the pleural effusion, you can do what's called a cardiocentesis or pleural tap. The procedure is essentially where you aspirate excess pleural fluid, and this is both therapeutic, but also the fluid can be analyzed to see what is in it. This can help the doctor uh, help them identify a potential cause of the pleural effusion, either heart failure or cancer or autoimmune, for example. The next clinical anatomy uh, condition is a pneumothorax, which is essentially where you have accumulation of air in 
the plural space. Pneumo as in air, thorax as in the thorax. Now there's two main mechanisms of how people get pneumothorax. These are spontaneous pneumothorax and open pneumothorax. Spontaneous pneumothorax is usually a result of a ruptured bulla seen in lung conditions such as COPD. This rupture of bulla causes air essentially to leak into the pleural space. And so when there's so much air that occupies the space, it will actually push against the lungs, causing partial collapsing of the lung. An open pneumothorax is usually due to an external trauma, which causes air to leak into the pleural cavity from the outside. And this also causes the lung to collapse again. When you percuss, it will actually be hyperresonant because there is air within that cavity. This means that when you auscultate the area, there will be usually reduced breath sounds or even no breath sounds. As you can see, here is an example of a chest x-ray of someone who has a left-sided pneumothorax. As you can see, this line uh, denotes the lung and it's being pressed by air that's entering the pleural space. There's something called pneumothorax, and then there's something called tension pneumothorax, which is a life-threatening condition. It is really where there's over-accumulation of air in the pleural space, usually as a result of a valve mechanism. So it's usually from an external trauma causing an opening, such as maybe like a cut or a wound. Now, the opening somehow works as a valve in which when you breathe in, inspire, air will come in and it will increase the pleural pressure, and when you expire during expiration, however, the air can't leave the pleural space because the hole closes up like a valve. And so you can imagine with each inspiration, pressure will build up in the pleural, pleural cavity. This causes the lungs to collapse even more. And also the large increase in pressure will start pushing other structures around. For example, it will cause tracheal deviation to the opposite side of where the tension pneumothorax is. It will also push against the heart, causing decreased cardiac output and hence hypotension. The compression of the heart can also mean there is an obstruction of the heart filling system, causing a characteristic raise in JVP. Here is an example of a chest x-ray of someone who has a left-sided tension pneumothorax. As you can see, all this area here is air, not within the lungs, but within the pleural space. And it is collapsing, it has totally collapsed the lung and also starts to push against the other structure, pushing all structures to the right. You can see tracheal deviation, you can see compression of the heart. This is life-threatening. And because tension pneumothorax is a life-threatening condition, what needs to be done is an emergency needle decompression. Classic approach is second intercostal space midclavicular with a needle allowing air to essentially exit from the pleural space.